So today uh, we have Brandon Lewis here. Brandon is going to talk to us about the art of creative coding. Brandon has been developing software for about 20 years and is currently a senior manager of software engineering at one of Perth's largest mutuals. He's presented previously at DDD and his previous chat was around uses of blockchain outside of cryptocurrency. Today, he'll be exploring the question, can code create art? Over to you. Oh, Thank, thanks very much. Um, wow, it's a good turnout. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank the, the sponsors for DDD Perth. Uh, without their generous support, this event wouldn't be possible. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that. Today, what I really want to do is I, I have three objectives. Um, I'm hoping to sort of inspire all of you to, to try your hand at creative art, or creative or generative art, um, and create code or create art with code. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the tools that you might be able to use to do this and some techniques, some basic techniques to sort of get you started. What you shouldn't expect is a maths masterclass. So while there are, there are some relationships between mathematics and creative coding, I'm still very much uh, a student of maths, uh, more so than a teacher, so, um, so don't expect any, any, any uh, math secrets, to be honest. Um, and Web3 and, and NFTs, big topics, of course, uh, don't expect to learn how to get rich off Dogecoin or with Dogecoin um, selling profile pics. That's, that's not what we're here for. A bit about me. Uh, I've been developing commercial software for about 20 years. I've been coding for closer to 30 at this point. Uh, I've worked across the entire software stack from front end to back end and everything in between. I specialized in integration for many, many years uh, before moving into leadership roles uh, and proceeding with that into my, uh, my career. Currently, I'm a software engineering manager at a large WA-based mutual, where I, I lead a bunch of awesome people to do cool stuff, and I support them in, in being awesome. Uh, you can find me on all of the various Twitters and LinkedIns and, and whatnot, and I blog about leadership in my, uh, in my blog at leaderkaizen.com. Uh, of course, I, being a leader, I don't really code all, as, all that much anymore um, I in my work day to day, so I have to get my coding kicks elsewhere. And to do that, I usually create my own projects and, and work on things on the side in my spare time. Uh, that's sort of how I came to, to get involved with Unity and, and learn Unity and develop game prototypes with it. I really enjoy understanding how those processes and mechanics work and seeing if I can create them myself. It's a good learning experience and, and keeps my skills um, current, I suppose. Uh, it's also how I got into to shaders. So uh, from, from uni Unity and learning uh, mechanics and, and developing those things, I got into shader development, which is really my gateway to, to creative coding and, and how I got into that. Some of the examples of, of shaders I've created uh, are things like some missive shaders for lava, um, obscuring or ob objects that are obscured and, and doing outlines and, and mixing uh, messing with things like Z-buffer and whatnot to fake, uh, fake um, transparency and the like and some ripples and whatnot. Um, but of course, I haven't actually cr uh, finished a game and this twi twi tweet kind of explains why. Uh, that's, that's kind of, you know, that explains me, really. But it turns out that my first experience with creative coding was actually many, many years ago, uh, when I was about nine years old. Uh, I joined a computer club, you know, with all the, all the cool kids did, right? Uh, and got introduced to Logo. Uh, in Logo, uh, with Logo, you create, you move a turtle around and draw images on the screen, and it's actually used to, uh, to promote um, software literacy and develop skills uh, at, a, at a low level. I didn't realize at the time, of course, uh, but it was, um, it was fun, I suppose. And what I'd like to actually do is maybe, uh, maybe share some of the things that you could do with Logo because uh, that's pretty cool. Um, of course, being this is a, a Logo interpreter developed in, in, uh, in JS and JavaScript, uh, available freely and, and online. Um, I'll have links and resources at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. Uh, but of course, being nine, this is kind of what I created, right? Like, 
as, as, as you would draw on a, on a piece of paper. And of course, when, when your skills are limited uh, and you don't really know what you're doing, you kind of just chaos, right? Just chaos. And just create all sorts of random stuff that you think looks cool. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't until recently that I realized you could actually do some pretty cool things like uh, some depictions of mathematical algorithms uh, in, in Logo itself, and I, I thought that was pretty cool. So this is, a, this is uh, an example of Philotaxis, which is, a, um, it is the, the way that leaves grow on stems and plants. So it's a, it's a biology, uh, biology thing, which is tied to a uh, mathematical, can be represented mathematically, and thus depicted in, in code. And I thought that was pretty cool. Sorry, technical issues. Yeah, real technical issues. <laughs> cool. Uh, uh, so, technology has evolved obviously since uh, since Logo, and the ability to create. To create such stuff is is a lot more accessible and a lot easier to do, um, particularly with things available on the web. Like you just saw, I, I could do logo with um, through through a browser, which is really cool. Uh, but today I'm going to be showing you uh, P5JS and Shader Toy, which are two tools that create art in very different ways. Uh, and I'm going to sort of speak through how those differ. But both tools are web-based, both are freely available, don't require any subscriptions or any payment, and you don't even have to create an account on any of the sites. You can just kind of use them. There are there are comparisons that you can draw between creative code or, or creative or art generated through code and um, and traditional art, and I like to view them as uh, the programs that you use or the apps that you use are very much the mediums, much like canvases and stone and wood, where they determine largely the thing you're going to create. So you, you don't you don't create a sculpture with a canvas, for example, and you can sort of view tools in, in the same sort of vein. Mm -hmm. And then the algorithms and the, the methods that you use to create these things, the code that you create, that's your brushes and your pens and your chisels. Uh, and so I'm going to talk through some of, uh, some of those today uh, as, as we work through some of the demos. Um, generative art is, uh, I think, and I'll sort of take a small tangent here and speak of NFTs like I wasn't going to do, but I genuinely think that uh, generative art is a real genuine use case for NFTs. Packaging the code along with the parameters to create the thing I think is, is, is very valuable and I think is a, real, um, is a real benefit and a genuine use case for NFTs. Mm. Uh, processing with P5.js. So P5.js is the first of the tools I'm going to speak to you about today and it's, it's based on processing. It's a flavor of processing. And processing was developed in I think 2001 uh, as a uh, as a software literacy tool, it's a it's a Java-based graphics library and IDE that uh, that you can draw stuff with. Uh, it's it is uh, highly powerful and it's used for things like simulations as well. So it's got a breadth everywhere from sort of beginner level access to to very um, very high level. But P5JS is a web implementation of that, as the name suggests, leveraging JavaScript. Uh, it does have a web editor, or you can build your own, which I think is pretty is pretty nifty. Um, as I mentioned, it's e it's really easy to use, really easy to get into, uh, and it's reasonably well documented. Uh, you can there are enough similarities, uh, while not a direct one to one port of, of processing, the the similarities are, are close enough that you could actually leverage the documentation in tandem. Uh, it is, I consider, sort of a high-level language. It abstracts a lot of the difficulty and complexity in creating some of this stuff quite well. So, for example, you can draw a circle, or you can draw a square, or if you're in 3D, a cube or a sphere. Um, and you also use vectors, and vectors is kind of, uh, we'll touch on some of those bit in a bit. Um, but having that control really expands your, the possibilities that you have. Uh, and it's a bit more, like I say, a bit more high-level than, than shaders that we'll touch on a bit later. You can, like I say, do 2D and 3D stuff. Uh, so um, we'll we'll speak through some of those as well. To give you an example, uh, these were all created with P5.js. So as you can see, very different 
uh, in style, very different in nature. Uh, and I can speak particularly for the for the um, the one on the right. That took a lot of time and a lot of effort. It's really interesting how that came about. And the author or the the artist um, posted a really good blog post on that, which which I'll I'll share in the slide deck as well. That they got they talk about how they actually created it, and it's fascinating to see that actually um, come to life and, and come to fruition. Long process took many months. Mm. And of course, you can create animations, and I think that's. Um, that's one of the, the strongest draws of this in terms of, uh, in terms of comparisons with traditional art. And it's something I think we as, as developers, as coders, have, um, have an advantage in. We can create some really cool animations um, with, with things like P5.js and Shader Toy. So let's get on to some, some demos, right? Sans the technical difficulties. So, P5.js, you can go to a built-in editor. Uh, like I said, super, super simple. Uh, if you want to create a circle, uh, create a circle, and then we'll do it in the middle of the screen. So, width divided by two, height divided by two. If I could type, that'd be great. And 50. And it's a, a radius of 50, or a diameter of 50. And you create a circle. Super easy. Uh, you change the color of the circle, so change the fill to, I don't know, uh, Red, maybe, because red. Yeah, yeah, red. So super easy to use. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the biggest draws in terms of getting into it and just uh, getting into creative art and trying to learn how to, to think creatively rather than problem solve. Uh, it's a really easy barrier, really low barrier to entry. But you can also create things like this, right? And this is an example of something I created with, uh, in collaboration with uh, the guys at MakerX. Uh, when w trying to, I suppose, depict or visualize earthquakes in an interesting fashion. Uh, and we use kind of uh, this the number of circles that it would generate as, uh, as the, the magnitude, so we would, would reflect those. Uh, and then plot them randomly or in term or perhaps in a geographical location um, and align that like that. But what's really interesting is that there aren't any circles here. Uh, these are actually created just by creating tangents, uh, tangents at regular intervals uh, and drawing a line. And this is, I think, wha where the real power, uh, we start to see the real power of something like uh, P5.js, where you can use vectors to to project these things, which are much more difficult to do if you have to roll it yourself. So what I actually do here is I take uh, a point on a circle, I project a vector on one direction, add it to the other side, and then draw a line between the two. And I just do that for everything, for uh, 360 times, and it kind of draws a circle. Uh, and I loop through, through all number of circles. So it's still relatively simple to do. I'm not using any advanced mathematics. It's basic high school maths. Um, and it creates some really interesting stuff. But of course, you can just keep creating new versions over and over. Um, or you could perhaps not even make it random. Uh, and you could take the circle out and have it depicted elsewhere. Uh, the creative part, and this is where it gets super, super interesting, is uh, you start off with something like this with a simple idea. And then you try to expand upon it. And you could perhaps create something a bit more like this. And this is completely different in many ways to, to the other, but the code is almost identical. But what I do here is instead of creating uh, line 360 lines to create a circle, I make them random. And I give them all different colors at different points uh, and just draw them, draw a number of them and vary the alpha uh, randomly as well. So you get the sort of stringy sort of look. Uh, and of course, oh, if I was to remove the seed, you can create and create and create all sorts of different images. And of course, you can constrain them. So uh, there, I'm, I'm not really doing anything, anything to limit where those things appear, but you can, uh, you can sort of do that. And we'll get to some examples that do that in a tick. Um, uh, 
but you can do something that's more structured, perhaps, uh, and something that perhaps even mimics real-life art, so like a painting or mm. something like that. And this is an example that I, I pulled together where I took uh, a cityscape, a city, um, city skyline as, uh, as, um, as inspiration. And I wanted to, I started off quite simply, where I just had, uh, true and false, I started out like that. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to experiment with was layering. Uh, layering on top of it to create this perspective and adjusting the alpha at various levels to, to give that sort of perspective. But then, of course, that evolution comes into play and you're like, well, I wanted to try, I wanted to try play with Bezier curves or Bezier curves. And so I added clouds as Bezier curves. Bezier curves, again, another example of how P5GS makes something that could be quite mathematically complex, if you wanted it to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be, mind you, but it can be. Um, and makes it really simple. It's a simple, it's a simple function to create it. Uh, down here somewhere. There's here. So I kind of created those. Uh, but then I, I thought, well, what if I want to make it look like a paintbrush instead of something that's solid like that? Um, I mean, that, that will look cool and stuff, but I mean, why not? This takes a bit of, bit of time. Why not create, to create a paintbrush? And the way I did that was, now there isn't a paintbrush. You can't say, hey, P5JS, draw me a paintbrush, or draw this in a paintbrush stroke pattern. Um, you have to create this manually, and, and that's just, that's easy. You take the square, and you take the pixels, and you just do one pixel at a time, and that's sort of why it takes a bit, a bit longer to do. Um, and we'll get into to how this, this is where one of the key differentiators between this and, and Shader Toy that we'll talk about later sort of comes into play. And then I thought, well, that doesn't really look brush-like, right? So you, you don't get the brush stroke at the end, and I wanted to just get brush strokes. So I added, I added a little randomness to the length of each stroke. So each line is going up in a single pattern, and I'm just, just mini or randomizing the height of that line each time to create a sort of brush stroke. Um, and the palettes, I mean, you might have, no might have noticed that I have palettes uh, for, or different palettes for everything, and that's just a list of, of JSON. Uh, JSON hex values, and I'll load them in, uh, and then randomly pick one. Uh, that's that's as simple as it gets, really. Speaking of Bezier curves, uh, I think Bezier curves are are a beautiful illustration of maths. Uh, they they they're really simple in in nature, but they can make some incredibly interesting shapes. Uh, and I sort of took inspiration here from, you know, the world windows screensavers and sort of kind of bouncing around. Uh, that, that was the inspiration, right? And, and uh, it's, I haven't colored any of these and that's, that's I think, the, the next, next phase is sort of what do you do with these to want to extend them? So you take something that's really simple in just 40 lines of code and you can create all sorts of different shapes. Um, and you start to want, you create a bit, your creative um, part takes over and you're like, well, wh what can we do with that? Uh, for this particular instance, I, I sort of took one Bezier curve and then just linked it to another one. But what if you made that random at some, in some way? Or what if you uh, had that deterministic in some other fashion? Um, and what if you added color? What if you added different shading to the different lines? Um, then you start to get some art, right? Um, I, noise. So uh, Speaking of randomness, there is, a s there is a lot of randomness in creative code, and there's, sorts of, there's, there's a few different ways you can approach that, right? And there's, you can have it either, either completely random between two values, and it'll pick something. But sometimes you need something a bit more nuanced, a bit, a bit more subtle, right? And noise is a great way to do that. Something like Perlin noise, for example, where it's a gradient of, of, of uh, randomness. It's something you can use in this in, in when you want something like this, where you're only incrementing uh, a value by a small amount from the last value every time, and you sort of iterate over that map, over that Perlin noise, and adjust the value accordingly. Uh, very, very powerful. Again, something that is natively built into P5.js. So, uh, speaking of rules, I mentioned rules earlier where you want to sort of constrain stuff, and I suppose this is more sort of software engineering-y, developer-y type of stuff. But you could constrain stuff 
like circle packing. And you could say, well, don't have any circles overlap, don't create circles in another circle, and create some interesting, some interesting patterns. Um, and you can then extend that again, evolutionary. Well, what can you do with that? Perhaps you have that in certain shapes. You could have that along a Bezier curve. So you have a Bezier curve and have the, the, the circles all pack along that curve within a certain radius and create lines like that. Or maybe you just want to represent, <laughs> represent Doge, right? Because why not? Uh, and and this, is a, this is a really cool example of just taking an image, uh, sampling the pixel of where your point is, and then making the color of that circle, that, that pixel color. Uh, and you can create something like this. And it, of course, you can, ad you can adjust all of, the, all of the values and you can have uh, circles be bigger or smaller. And you can, I, had to, I did have to make some changes to this to make the image a bit more legible because if you have massive, uh, massive circles, you then start to have huge circles of one color and it, you can't really get that definition. You don't really tell, you don't really tell what it is. So I had to implement something which would grow it and then slow it down as it got bigger. So as a circle got bigger, I would slow the, the growth down so that it wouldn't really go past much uh, a, a certain size and it would give time for more circles to fill in and pack it. And an example of, of Philotaxis again, so much like the logo example I shared earlier, but this time with nice pretty colors. Um, and I want to show this purely because I, I want to show that the, the mass around it is super, super simple. And I think this is something which initially uh, I found daunting when looking at creative code. I would see all these things on Twitter, all these things on LinkedIn, be like, that looks really cool, uh, but I'm sure that's really difficult to do. And it's when you start to really dig into it and you, you even just look up some, um, uh, you go into Wikipedia and you look up what some of these equations look like, and they're not difficult but they can create some really, really interesting patterns. Um, taking that a step further, and you can create images like that. That is the same pattern, just I'm, I'm now adjusting the size of each of the circles, um, and I'm, I'm coloring it a bit differently. That's really it. It's the same code, just a bit different. Same, same, but different. But it doesn't have to be all geometric. You can make stuff that's really random, uh, really interesting, uh, and almost paint-like. And this, I sort of, I tried to, to, to replicate or reproduce a, a Jackson Pollock painting. So with lots of just sort of paint everywhere in arbitrary ways. Um, and this is sort of what it comes up with. But of course the benefit being code is you can create as many as you want. And you can tell that they're all slightly different in terms of brush sizes, and that's all determined by the code. So I could limit it to certain brush sizes or, or brushes, or I could make it go wild. Uh, patterns, and, and you can introduce patterns to it. And there's a really interesting article I read about taking an, an image and using uh, the values of those images or the color values of those images to manipulate how the lines are drawn. So you end up having something that looks like this, but it has structure within it. I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, but this is the re this is really the uh, this particular example is the the technique I really wanted to go in depth with a bit more because you sort of you look at it and you can't it might be difficult to see what's going on or how you create that. But when I found out how to create this, I was amazed how easy it actually was. Uh, and it's all very, very logical. And it's easy to demonstrate as well. So you take a look at something like this, and all it is, is it's a, it's a flow field, but it's created with vectors, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which again, benefit of, of P5.js. But that's what it looks like. So you take, you take a grid, you take a, a canvas, you plot it into grids, and you can adjust the size of the grid as much as you want. Um, you then plot some Perlin noise over that and then take vectors based on that Perlin noise. So if, you're, if your noise is zero to one and you relate that to a radius or a, um, to a direction, uh, you then direct the vector in that way. And because Perlin noise is progressive, uh, it's, it's you start to get this sort of feel, this, this motion, as you will. So it's sort of like forces being applied. 
all of the all of the directions that you see here are just uh, other directions of the flow field influenced by Perlin noise. And you can create, of course, uh, I think I've got this randomized. I think maybe possibly. I, I do like that seed. <laughs> oh, is it going to create the same one? Over. Yeah, but I can take a better seed. How's that? Oops. I mean, you could put in, put in any seed, really. Now, I will I will confess there is a bit of a bug in it, and you'll see occasionally you can see it here, where on the edges it sort of gets trapped between two. So again, you get to you get to do some problem solving as an engineer. And figure out well how do you make uh, how do you adjust the the force or the direction of those so that you don't end up having these infinite loops on either side. But of course it can be adjusted even further. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, have it go longer. So right now I'm constraining the time so it only has a certain amount of time to create. Uh, and it's it's that's probably something I, I should have called out. It's the alpha that makes it do that. So it's like putting a whole bunch of pixels on the onto the screen, and then adjusting the alpha gradually over time as you as you throw in more pixels and those pixels kind of travel around and as they leave more trails you start to get thicker thicker lines in the areas that they travel um, but it's the vector at, at, at the heart of it it's the vectors that really that really help to make this possible uh, but again super super easy right there is nothing that should stop anyone uh, even someone with very limited development experience or programming experience to do this sort of stuff so I'd highly, highly recommend people try it out. Um, cool. And then, no. Yes. Cool. So, uh, P5, P5.js, in summary, is a is an, is a fantastic tool for pretty much anyone to get into Creative Code. It's easy to uh, it's easy to get into. It's well well documented. Uh, but it's also a really good tool for anyone with um, with, with advanced programming experience. And the reason I say that is because it, I've only just scratched the surface. There is a breadth of, of capability there which you can leverage. I didn't even touch on the 3D stuff that you can do, um, but you can do 3D and it, it does support shaders, for example, and you can hook it up to all sorts of other sources. And it's fantastic for kids. Um, it if Logo was what we were taught sort of 30 years ago, um, this is, is what kids should be taught now, in my view. Uh, extra benefit, th the skills are transferable. So JS, you can transfer that. Shaders. Uh, shaders with Shader Toy. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, I got into Unity, and that introduced me to shaders. And shaders are a C-like C-like-ish language, um, or use a C-like C -like language, um, like J um, GLSL and HLSL. They are, they are high-level languages, but as I would liken them to lower-level languages than, say, um, P5.js, in that they are assembly-like. It's not assembly by any means, but you you the way you have to think about working with them is very much assembly-like. Uh, they're used in the graphics render pipeline for 3D stuff uh, and used for things like lighting, shadows, uh, reflections, all that kind of thing. Uh, the there are several different types of shaders, by the way. So uh, vertex shaders, geometry shaders, and fragment shaders, they all do different things. We're going to focus primarily on fragment shaders today. And what's really interesting is these are some examples I've created. There isn't any 3D geometry in there. There are no triangles, there are no meshes, there are no, no quads, no vertices whatsoever. That's all drawn, effectively drawn, to the screen. Uh, and a call out to Inio Quiles, who did the rainforest. He's got a fantastic uh, YouTube video on how he made that. Absolutely worth a watch. Uh, and we'll get on to some more demos. Um, before I get too far in, I just want to give a quick, a quick sort of uh, shakedown of what, what shaders are. Uh, 
in a typical 3D environment, you have a mesh that's made up of vertices and some lines between them, uh, creating triangles. Then you can apply a material to it, but of course the material doesn't have any value until you apply some light to it. So you get some light and you get a material. You can then also provide some directional lighting and some shading on the material. It's all of the, m all of the material stuff is, th is the shadery bits is that we're going to be talking about. So um, we're not going to worry about the vertices today. We're just going to be talking about the shaders. I'm sorry about the, the, um, the fragment shader. Uh, I'm going to skip these examples because we're running low on time, but head over to Shader Toy to check those out because they're really, really interesting. Um, but the thing I really wanted to, uh, the, the method or, or um, the technique I wanted to share with you with regards to shaders is ray marching. That is how those images were done. Um, and it's a really interesting technique to apply to, um, to creative coding in general. And it's you can use that to create proper scenes or you can create, it, create um, fractals and, and all sorts of interesting stuff with them. And the whole notion of it is um, effectively looking at, looking at a scene and measuring the distance between the camera and something in the scene, figuring out what's closer and rendering that. And you render it pixel by pixel. I think that's, that's the key thing to, to bear in mind with shaders, is you are not actually saying, hey, draw me a circle, draw me a square, draw me a cube. You are saying, I want this color at this color pixel at coordinate x, y to be this color. Uh, and that is all very mathematically, or can be very mathematically intensive. Um, so it's a bit more daunting to get into, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but ray marching is, is a process of um, determining the distance between objects in the scene and your camera. So I created this little sort of demo thing to sort of show how that might work. And I'm gonna turn off all those. So say you started off with, uh, say you started off with your camera in the middle of the scene, and we have a ray that's going out from the scene. Now, say you add some objects into the scene, right? You want to you want to try and figure out which. So, if I'm looking in this direction, what am I supposed to render to the screen? Uh, I'm supposed to render number one at this particular pixel. So, how do we do that? Well, we draw lines. We we try to w we go through we loop through the entire area, entire scene, and say, well. How far are you? How far are you? How far are you? And you try to draw the close, but you don't want to draw it to the, to the origin of that. You want to draw it to the origin of the surface of that. And that's where stuff gets interesting because that uses sine distance fields to calculate where the surface of it is based on what the center or the origin is of that object. And you do that iteratively. So you take further and further steps as you get out into the, into the scene to figure out when you hit something. So as you can see here, I haven't actually hit anything because I haven't reached my minimum distance that I to, to get to the object. I haven't realized that, hey, I'm actually at a surface. But if you extend that further, you start to see it expand. And you can see where you're starting to actually hit things. Um, and you return that back to your, uh, back to your code and you say, I'm going to display pixel of this color at this coordinate. So in a nutshell, that is that is ray marching, and that's used through each of or through the rest of these e these um, these examples. Uh, I, I created a basic bootstrap um, ray marching uh, shader, which will be in, in 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 the resources at the end of the slideshow. Uh, but essentially, all it all it is is a basic uh, algorithm to to do ray marching, and the magic here all happens if you forget the calc normal calc lighting, um, happens sort of here. And for this example, the, the distance for a sphere, if you want to calculate the, the sine to distance field for the sphere, is calculated with this, right? Now, the benefit is you don't have to worry about having to work all this out. Some, some very smart people have already worked out the sine distance fields for almost every shape you can think of. Um, you then take those and combine them. And you combine them using Boolean operators, so you can union them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them or add them. And that's, that's effectively how you would create a scene. And for example, I created this for DDD Perth, where 
it's just some lights going around, but there is no geometry in the scene, right? This is all just, I'm picking a pixel uh, in a screen based on its distance for something. And I can even show you what that might look like. Uh, if you take the, the O here, for example, and this is when demo gods strike me down. Uh, so if I was to just return, say, um, the main O, right? So I'm returning the distance to the main O. Oops. Uh, alt, yeah, there we go. And I just get a sphere, because that's all I started off with. But then what if I, what if I returned the minimum? No, oh, actually, I don't think I'd do min maximum will work. Uh, if I did the, m the maximum value of the main O and, say, the whole. Oh, wrong one. My bad. Oops. Hold on. Let demo god strike me down. There we go. So what I've done here is I've effectively negated uh, the the main O. So the main O is no longer visible, and only the Ds within it are right. But you can create a mask. Actually, if I do mask, it might. It might. Oops. This is why you don't do live coding, people. Um, so by doing this, what I've done is I've, sub I've created a, an intersection between the O and the mask that I've got for the circle in the middle. And that's how you would, you would create a scene based out of uh, these primitives that you would create with sign distance fields. And it, it when, you sort of, when you start to look at that, you start to really appreciate what some of these more complex um, more complex images really take to, to create. It's a far more, um, so I, I appreciate that experience a whole lot more. Uh, of course, the benefit is you can do stuff like this as well. If you were to try and create this sort of thing with a with traditional sort of 3D geometry, uh, your machine would be on fire. Um, and and so, but you can you can do this because you can do this in, in shaders because you're not affecting you're not affecting geometry. You are effectively changing the shape of the environment. You are affecting the environment, not the geometry itself. So this is this this whole um, field of spheres is created just by m by applying a modulo to the sphere, and it creates all of these all of these spheres. Um, the the intersections or the uh, the operators that I mentioned earlier, and because you're using sine distance fields, allow you to do cool stuff like if this, this thing is close to this thing, take this point and this point, and if it's close enough together, do something with it. And that's how you sort of get this, uh, this glob effect. Um, I, I I'm really keen to try and make this into sort of a metaballs type of thing or like a lava lamp. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but you don't have to just do, uh, you don't have to just do sort of shapes and stuff. Uh, again, another mathematical uh, ingenuity or another mathematical principle, uh, the Mandelbrot set. And it's a depiction of it, just zooming in, and it's constantly evolving. And shaders are really good at doing this because uh, it you get to leverage the GPU to, to process and crunch some of these things, which is really effective. And you get to do some cool stuff with distances from, from various places. Um, so yeah, all, of those are, all of those are available on Shader Toy to take a look at. Nope. Nope. So that did it work? Did it work? No. It it is changing here. Like it's changed. It's kind of semi changing there, but I don't know. I don't know, man. This is. See, it just goes to show you. No matter how much you prepare, I tell you what, just. So uh, do that and go back. Oh, maybe I've just got to do that. No, it's just not moving at all. Like I'm moving slides here, but it's not moving. Nope. Oh, there we go. That'll do. Uh, alt five, uh, five. Go back. Yay! There you go. So, uh, so 
sorry about that. Uh, Shadatory requires a shift in mindset. And I think that's the key takeaway for Shadatory in particular. It's definitely not as approachable as something like P P5.js. Uh, it is mathematically intensive. You do have to think about how, how you want to solve problems. And that can be a bit daunting, but it can also be very rewarding. It's, I, I personally prefer creating stuff in, in, in Shader Toy and creating shaders. They, they just sort of tickle my fancy, I suppose. Um, but it off also offers great opportunities. So things like fractals, for example, and that's, that's, that's sphere field. You just can't realistically do that in, s in something like, s like P5.js. Um, and I like the challenge, right? But at the end of the day, it's different strokes for different folks. Uh, there is no best tool. Uh, so use whatever suits you. Su use whichever is going to fulfill your needs. Um, and think about what you want to create. What is the best tool going to be for that? Um, and more importantly, I think try to master one. Uh, I've tried to, to sort of do both, and that's been a, that's been a challenge. Uh, I, I don't think I've got very good at either of them. I'm still learning. Um, so try to, try to master one. I've seen... I think some of that stuff that, that I've shown you today, some of the other examples, um, those are from people who have focused on, on mastering one of them. So the key, key takeaways for today, uh, you don't have to be an artist to create art. Uh, and I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said every artist was first an amateur. Uh, so like, try it. Don't be scared to. Uh, pick the tool that suits you uh, and experiment. There is no right way to do it. Uh, and the creative part of this, I think, is, is the most important, less so than the coding. Uh, it's being feeling free to try and, and do new things. Um, and I just want to call out that I've all of this and everything I've learned, I've been standing on the shoulders of giants, and in particular, these individuals, uh, and a, a in especially uh, the likes of Dan Schiffman, who's, got a, uh, who's authored a book called Nature of Code, which is absolutely worth a read. Um, and Inio Aquiles, who is just a master at Shader Toy. Thank you very much. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much, first of all, Brandon. We've had a few technical difficulties. Ooh. I will get that turned off, but thank you all for coming. Um, just a reminder, we do have morning tea in the foyer, um, so if everyone can make a move there, that would be fantastic.